you this question, what do these things mean, right? So a sun is like direct sunlight all day, part sun, filtered light. We've got part shade, full shade, and dense shade, right? So in North Carolina, when you're out in the middle of the forest, you're getting about 10 to 12% sunlight in a lot of places, and in some places as low as 4% sunlight. That's really deep shade. That's why in a lot of those places, all you see are like beech trees, which are actually clonal from a mother tree, right? So the mother tree's sending in sugars because a lot of the things down there can't survive. Or you get only those ephemeral plants that come in the spring and the fall when the trees have, don't have any leaves on them, then shade. Where you get more into full shade, where you know you get this sort of more dappled light, looking at sun. Um, reflected light in downtown Durham, you'll see on one side of the street, trees are doing pretty well, and the other they aren't. Or you'll see on that same side of the road, some trees do great, and then a block down, they don't. That's often because of this reflected heat and reflected light, right? Some of them are facing west next to glass and brick, where they're just getting fried and others have sort of a tree in front of them, so it becomes more dappled light and the stuff behind them doesn't heat up. Water, are we not getting any? Are we getting too much? What does the surface look like? Soil quality, which uh, Ashley went through, right? So is it good, is it bad? How are the trees gonna get in there? So as you're going through and deciding what to plant where, start writing it down. Right? Like stand there and look at all the things that are going to impact where you're planting your tree. Right? What does it look like above ground? What does it look like below ground? What is the surface like? So this sort of, you want to figure out what kind of things are impacting that space right there. And that'll lead down to how big of a tree can we plant in the end, right? So we've got a lot of above ground sites but not much below ground space, so we still might not be able to plant a huge tree, or vice versa. Sun exposure, um, you're gonna wanna think about how rigorous does that tree have to be? Is this like downtown Durham, where we have to plant what I call bulletproof trees? You know, the trees you can put a shotgun against and like it still like shakes it off and moves on? Or we got space to plant a more delicate tree, like a white oak, where if you look at it wrong, it's gonna like die, right? <laughs> so we just need to think about like how, how tough is that space? And, you know, I always try to plant the biggest tree possible and the most delicate tree feasible, right? Because there's a lot of really tough spaces, so we want to really use those tough trees for those tough spaces. But where they're more beautiful and lovely spaces, we should be planting those more uh, delicate and lovely plants. So it drives me crazy to see a crepe myrtle in the front yard, but I'm actually very okay with a crepe myrtle and a four by four concrete block in the middle of impervious surface, right? <laughs> because that can survive, but in a front yard we could plant like a beautiful big flowering whatever, yellow, Kentucky yellow wood. Um, yes? So your, your comment about the white oak, you're talking about in a circumstance like downtown in a small area, you look at it wrong, it will die, or is yes. it the most vulnerable of all the oaks? Is that what you're Right, so what, I threw out white oak because they, this was sort of the more southern range of their species, of their uh, zones, and now with climate change, their zone is moving north, yeah. and so it is out of zone now. Yeah. So if you're doing any work around a white oak, you have to be really loving to it in order to keep it alive, and if you plant it, you have to plant it in a space that is unusually cool with great soil and even moisture and good shade, right? Because it's sort of out of, out of its uh, preferred area, mm -hmm. right? I mean, other trees are also like maybe in this area, but very delicate. So for example, Carolina silver bell. This is like its area and it's indigenous to it, but it sort of needs very specific conditions to thrive. So that, those are two things you might think about when you're looking at more delicate trees. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, next up is trees for your needs. So um, just after you've gotten everything together, we wanna start thinking about what size and shape and type of tree you want to plant. So in some of those smaller growing, like smaller spaces, you might try wide and tall and multi-stem, right? So this is going to be a little bit more privacy, wind breaks, buffering, high wildlife value. There's not a lot of space below ground, probably, right? Or there could be, but there's not a lot of space tall. There's not a lot of tall space. A lot of these get wide, so you kind of have to have enough room for it to sort of widen out like a bell at the ball with those big dresses. Um, 
So I'm just going to run through four to five of each of these different types to give you some examples. Um, does anybody know what this one is? Which one are you pointing to? This uh, top right. Any guesses? It does look like a precipia. It's a witch hazel. Pam and Malice, Virginiana. Uh, very pretty yellow one. I'll just run. Um, fringe. Fringe tree. Yeah, American fringe tree is my favorite. Yeah. There's also Chinese fringe tree, beautiful American fringe tree in Forest Hills. Um, just, I mean, it's the most beautiful one I've ever seen. It looks just like this during the spring. Um, and then there's some Asiatic fringe trees over by Whole Foods in the planting strip between the parking lot and the Duke building there. Oh, Those wow. are great, wow. great small space trees. It's been pruned up really nice. And are the, is this American fringe tree the one you see in Forest Hills, planted in shade? Yeah, okay. I would consider that. That's like a deeper shade. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone guess what's up? Very good guess, because it does have that same sort of general uh, branchiness. Dogwoods have usually have fewer branches and tend to be single stem mm -hmm. instead of multi-stem. Oh. Um, my first time I went off. I'm doing good. Mm -hmm. uh, the service fairy. Oh, right. Yep. Oh. There's a couple different varieties of service berry. Yep, there's like three or four native service berries, I think, and then a couple non-native. Uh, and this is, Buckeye. I guess it's Buckeye. 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 Sumac. A what? Sumac Sumac tree. Oh my. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite trees. Y'all ever heard of pink lemonade? That's what this originally was made out of, is sumac berries. They're really like high vitamin C, really tart, really beautiful, I love them. Um, high wildlife value. This is more of a suckering tree, so it'll create more of a thicket. Um, also used, I've used it when I've had like the really bad chest cold. I've used the leaves medicinally for that. So that's fun facts. Is there some sumac that's poisonous? There is a poison sumac. Yeah, so all of the edible berries, I'm not teaching an edible class, for your information, not <laughs> your doing, um, all of the edible sumacs have the pink berries, the poison sumac has white berries that are kind of like leaned over like a sad ghost. Um, and they're mostly found, hey, welcome. Uh, they're mostly found in swamp areas, the poison sumac are. And what's the, the you know, the Latin name of that sumac? Um, Bruce. 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 Yeah, I was thinking of staghorn. Labra. Uh, Labra. Smooth. That's smooth one. What's and also winged. Winged is a lot of. Good question. I didn't hear. It, so the, the um, Bruce uh, Tiffana. Yeah, Tiffana. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I usually have the Latin names at the tip of my tongue. I'm having trouble with words this morning. Uh, so now small maturing, small maturing trees. These are typically single stem. They can be quasi multi stem. Uh, they typically go up to 15 feet. So we're looking more at that small stature, sort of small front yard type of trees. I'm going to move through a little bit, not too much quicker. Uh, any idea of what this one is? These are really good guesses. It is not a red bud, although it does have, red buds do have more pink, they have more pink flowers. Very similarly big. So this has a lot more branches than a typical red bud. You know what? It is a red bud. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good job. Seriously, it's kind of guesses. To me, up here, it looks like a cherry tree because yeah. cherry trees typically have more multi-stem than red buds do. The mm -hmm. biggest thing that cued me in that you were correct and I was not. You see how there's buds right on the branches? Mm -hmm. Very typical of a red bud. Never happens in a cherry tree. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> My red buds, I have, have had lots of Multi-stem, yeah. So oftentimes red buds will sort of come from the bottom, particularly cultivated varieties. Um, for example, the one I have in my yard is uh, Merlot. That tends to have a lot more lower branches. And I think it's because they're bred to have much more flowers, so much more branches. When you see them in the woods or you see them sort of more natively, they tend to have one main stem and then they'll branch off a lot. 
Yeah, but that's because they're slower. They're smaller growing trees, right? So the equivalent, if this was scaled up to 10 times as big, this would be 10 times as long. So that's 50 feet as opposed to five feet. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody said something else about red buds? Question? Oh, I just thought maybe it's one I've just seen where that's an open area. Usually they don't have that many stems or folds. Yeah. yeah it's just kind of dangling like this. It's yeah. a good point, right? And so what you're seeing is exactly what you said. This is more of an open full sun, right? So trees uh, with full sun, it's like a buffet. They can't help themselves and they get greedy and they go for all the sun helpings, right? And one of the challenges with red buds is they don't have that strong of wood. So they'll crack more when they have a lot of these if the branches aren't well spaced. Um, but they are more beautiful, right? So in the shade, they're gonna tend to put, instead of putting their energy out, they're gonna put their energy up, right? And so that's where you get more single stem, where they find that patch of light, they have a lot of branches. So that's a really good observation about the way that the same tree is gonna look different in the sun and the shade. Thank you for presenting that. Yeah. That's a good point. So a lot of these smaller trees, uh, they are more ephemeral from like a human lifespan standpoint, right? So you'll typically get these trees that live between 10 and 35 years, more or less. Um, that's why I think that planting these small trees, these are trees for us, like me right now. The bigger trees are trees for my children and my children's children. Because to your point, like if I plant an oak, I'm, not, I'm gonna see some shade in my lifetime, but they're really gonna flourish in my children's lifetime. So when we're thinking about planting, that's what we want to plant and mix in our own yards that we have responsibility over, right? We want to plant trees for me, but also trees for them. Make sense? I really like how you present that, and that's a good thing. The other thing we want to think about when planting is this, um, the time sequence of our space. So when I plant a yard, I like to plant a bunch of these types of trees because in the first 10 to 30 years, these are going to be the showcase. But I also plant a lot of oaks because once these start to fade out, right, they're going to get diseases, they're just going to crack, whatever, then those oaks are really taking off. So you have this continuous beauty in your yard, but you have to think time-wise. So thank you for thank you for bringing that up. So what, um, what she was saying, tell me your name one more time. My name? Yeah. Alice. Thank you, Alice. What Alice was just saying is we also want to think not just time-wise, uh, not just time-wise over years, we want to think time-wise over seasons, right? So we want to have something interesting for us and for life, pollinators and birds, throughout the entire season. So uh, cherries come in really early in this season, like flowering apricots are some of the earliest, and then you have the red buds, and then the dogwoods, and then, and then, and then, and then, right? All the way through sort of the fall, which is why the uh, Hamamalus virginianus, which is a fall blooming uh, shrub, can provide that last season. So you get full season, and also different structures, right? So it's good to plant stuff like this for some of the birds and pollinators that tend to stay low to the ground, like um, Carolina wren. Mm -hmm. You know, those are more ground hunters, but you also want the stuff that likes to hunt in the trees, like chickadees, two of my favorite birds. <laughs> ah, okay, any guess what this one is? Dogwood, that's right. Wow. Yeah, this is up that. north, yeah. where it can take more sun because there's not as much heat. Wow. Down here, planting a dogwood in the full sun, it's not gonna look like this, it's gonna look very sad. I speak from personal experience. Uh, any guess for this one? Japanese maple. Japanese maple. Right? These are, I think this is like not a great place for it because it's got all this space. We could plant something bigger, but it's still beautiful, right? 
And like thinking about beauty, you don't have to plant everything just for function. Beauty is a function, right? But this is also a nice tree for patios, really small tight spaces. It doesn't do anything for pollinators, but does do a lot for Katie's, so I like that. <laughs> um, any guess for this one? Smoke tree, yeah. These are really underutilized. They're crazy beautiful. Um, I forgot what this one is, so we're not going to talk about that one. Oh, this is ironwood. It's a multi stem ironwood, I believe. I have a, unfortunately, the pictures did not translate on this little thing, so I'm having trouble remembering. Do smoke trees prefer full sun? They do really well in full sun. Yeah, uh, it's harder to get the American smoke tree. I think it's more pretty. Uh, one thing about early horticulturalists is we got, we arrived in America, we explored America, sent all these things back to Europe, and we're like, hey, look, Europe, look at how cool America stuff is. But here we were like, Psh, America stuff, that's dumb. <laughs> Went to Asia, grabbed Asia stuff, brought it here, and was like, hey, look, America, look at how cool Asia stuff is. Right? And so we've spent 50 years breeding Asiatic plants, yeah. right? We've bred them for flowers, we've bred them for toughness, we've bred them for structure. It was only in the past 10 years or so that we were like, wait a second, American stuff is really cool, right? And started breeding that for flowers and structure and toughness. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why we have like 10 different types of smoke trees from Asia or all these different, um, we got tons of stuff from Asia that like, fits perfectly, not as much stuff from America yet. But as we start, we've got a lot of plant breeders starting to breed stuff, but trees, you know, they take a while. It's not like a flower that every year you can breed new stuff. You know, if you're trying to breed like a really beautiful service berry, American service berry, it's gonna take like several generations to see what you want. So that's why um, there are more non-natives than natives right now, and the natives we have are just starting to be able to serve the same functions as non-natives. Does that make sense? Medium maturing trees, single stem typically up to 60 feet or so. So this is like generally from 35 to 60 feet. So some of them we can plant under power lines and some of them we can't. I've got five minutes to get through this and I think I can. <laughs> uh, any guess for this? Magnolia. Southern Magnolia. This is an exception to the rule I just told you because trees make liars out of me every single time. <laughs> um, Southern Magnolias we've been breeding forever because they're just beautiful. Right, so we have southern magnolias called little gems that stay typically, when you hear something, uh, usually people are talking about 30 years in good condition. So little gems usually stay about 15 to 20 feet, although I've seen one that's 40 feet tall and very good conditions. But little gems stay more tiny and tight. Brown bears get up to 65 feet, and then of course our big southern magnolias can get like 80 feet and wide. Duke's campus is a beautiful place to see some native southern magnolias planted in the 1930s. Guess for this one? Some sort of oak. No, actually, but it's a good guess. Mm -hmm. I thought she said one of them. Sourwood. Yeah, so this is a native sourwood. I think they're really beautiful. They're a little bit more delicate, but they've got great fall color. They're great for pollinators. You can wrap um, fish in the leaves. Not that I recommend you doing that. Are they slow growing? Or are they relatively speaking, or sourwoods? Sourwoods are, uh, they can be. Yeah, they're not like the fastest growing trees. Any guess on this one down here? It's got a lot of small red flowers. It's got um, palmate leaf, divided leaves. There's a whole state named after it. Buckeye. 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 <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well done. It's a red buckeye. So this one, red buckeyes typically tend to be shrubs. This one was pruned up to a single stem. Okay. Yellow. It's a native. They're beautiful. I They're love something that. that. Yeah, I love them too. They have white too. The bottle brush white. They've got white buck. Uh, they've got white. They've got yellow flowers. Yellow buckeye. Variety of heights. So there's a lot of different options for this one. Um, so does this buckeye need the fair amount of water? Because I usually see them grow along the stream. They can grow in drier areas. A lot of things that prefer more water can take some drought if they've got good soil and are watered in for the first year or two and just nicely mulched. Yeah. But I've planted this, not, I wouldn't plant it like in a parking lot. 
right? But I've planted it in a southern, on a southern side of a building, you know, just really nicely taken care of. Um, this is an elm tree. So some of the smaller growing elms you'll see planted around the lot. Uh, Dutch elm disease wiped out a bunch of our native ones. I think the ones that are remaining are basically resistant to them. And we also have trees that have been bred to be resistant to them. Like Princeton uh, is a good example that's planted all the time. Does this have a leafing down in a way that had well, has yeah. an appearance of? Yeah. So actually, elms are sort of known to be leafing. The ones that have been bred aren't as much. But like winged elm has this really pretty sort of like weeping stance once it gets up to about 30 feet. My mom has the most beautiful winged elm, and it's just like that. It looks like a face shape. It's gorgeous. So, for example, it hangs down like lace. It does. Yeah. I love. And the the seeds and the uh, she asked if we, of elms can be are weeping, and they are. Once at, they're at maturity, they're known for being face shape, and they come down. And their seeds in the spring, she said, looks like lace, and that's what they look like to me. They look like lacy. Um, I love elms. Red elm is one of my favorite, also known as slippery bark elm. That is a um, fantastic throat lozenger and stomach, uh, tummy help. Um, <laughs> so very, very mild for children. So that's what it was used a lot for. Last is large maturing trees. Uh, anyone have a guess as to what this one is? Live, live oak. oak. Yeah, so these uh, live oak and there's a specific species out in Texas, uh, Texacana, Quercus Texacana, or sometimes it's Quercus, uh, Virg uh, what's it, live oak? Virginiana, Virginiana cross Texacana, so, uh, which is kind of a weird thing. Anyway, so these are moving into our area a lot more as far as range goes. So we should start seeing more of these planted ideally. Uh, all right, so these are anything that, these are like the big ones. These get the most benefits, the most shade, the most sort of everything, they're majestic. They're a sense of continuality between generations and forest space. Uh, they get a lot of presence. So anyone have any guess as to what this one is? It's like a beech tree. That's it, that's right, Carl, it's a beech tree. Yeah, beech trees, these are a little bit more sensitive, so you wanna plant them. They are communal trees, they like to be around other trees, they like to be in shade, but they're beautiful. Uh, any guess as to what this one is? Weeping is deciduous in the fall, but a lot of people think that it's evergreen. I'm looking at you. Bald cypress, that's right, bald cypress. Fun fact, in undergrad, I, uh, I was in the environmental technology department and I love these trees. I sat out in front of, under the shade, right? And then the, they looked evergreen and the fall came, they all turned red and lost all their leaves and I panicked. And I called the forestry department and said, your trees are dying. And they're like, thank you, freshmen. It is a bald cypress. Okay, I was trying my best. Um, but yeah, they, these are really beautiful. And there's another one called pond cypress that's planted in the park in downtown Durham, um, right next to Luna. Also very pretty, very narrow. Great trees. Um, so we have got the oaks over here. Oaks come in a very, a uh, lot of different shapes. So this one's more of a bottle brush oak, uh, kind of like a, a tulip poplar is very bottle brush. Uh, some of them are spreading like the live oaks or the willow oaks. There's the, um, one of my favorites, which are nut all oaks or Schumacher oaks, and they just have like that Christmas tree shape, right? They're very orthogonal branches. So oaks, North Carolina has some of the highest diversity of oaks in the world. So we have a lot to choose from here, which is pretty cool. And then of course the maples. Maples sort of cross between small, medium growing and large growing, depending on the maple. Uh, but those are also really good selections. I am only five minutes over, so I'm really <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> so we're gonna take about a 10 minute break um, and we'll come back. I'll take any questions after the break before we start our next one. But please come back right before the minute hand hits 12, which would be 11. Right before <laughs> 11, please. 